try that one more time. Well, a good thing is we have, we still have people coming in. Hi, Liz. Hi, Paula. Brandy, welcome. And we're having a little, tr little technical trouble. That's what happens with live, uh, live video. One moment. I believe I have figured it out. Okay, so please do let me know if you can see the uh, 80, 20, your health. Um, okay, Patrick is saying yes. And I'm gonna blow it up here a little bit. And now, does everyone see 80, 20, your health? Just type that into the chat box. All right, thank you so much, Mary. and. Uh, thank you everybody for your patience while we were getting that set up. Uh, tonight, we are going to be doing something a little bit different and I have a confession to make. I am in the process of writing a book and this is one of the, this is, I basically outlined the majority of the book and one of the chapters is going to be discussing using the 80-20 rule to improve your health and your health goals. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Now I'm going to go through basically what the 80-20 rule is and examples of it and what the next steps are for you to improve your health. Because I think once you have an understanding of the 80-20 rule, it changes the way you see everything in terms of not just your health, but really anything that requires results or anything that yields something or any sort of cause and effect, you're going to have a better appreciation of what is almost like a universal law of creation. It's really, really remarkable. And the 80-20 rule, many of you have heard me talk about it before, but I'm gonna go through what that is and why it's important. Um, it was developed in the early 1900s, maybe late 1800s, by a professor in Italy who was an economics professor by the name of Professor Pareto. And Professor Pareto basically was in Italy and he noticed that 20% of the population owned 80% of the land. Now, we hear a lot of that sort of talk these days, you know, where people are talking about the 1% and, and such and how there's always a sort of a, there's always a, there's a small group of people who own an enormous amount or who have an enormous amount of an impact. And while um, this is obviously not a political lecture, this, this law that this economics professor came up with is seen all across many, many different things and can be applied to many things to under, both understand what's going on as well as to improve the performance or the outcome of something that you're looking to do. So let's do some, um, we'll get into some, some examples for your health in just a moment, but let's think about some other 80-20s in our lives. So 20% of your clothes, you wear 80% of the time. If that is true for you, uh, type, that, type into the box that, that that's, you know, for some of us, it's 5% of our clothes we wear you know, 80% of the time. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who has 10 children and amazingly, and I said, what, um, how many of your kids, it's true, he's got 10 kids, what, what number, how many of your kids take up 80% of your effort as a parent? And he said, th there are three of them, they take up 80 or 90% of everything. Um, and the converse, is also true in the sense that um, basically 80, it's, it, you know, we'll, we'll get into a little bit, let's, let's take a, another example that, that's very easy to understand. Some, somebody, many of you may have a business, 20% of your products usually make up around 80% of your sales. 20% of your employees yield 80% of your sales. 80% uh, of your employees make up 20% of your sales. So this is an example of the, of the re reverse. And the, this, is, this sort of amazing thing happens in all different aspects of your life. And when it comes to the decisions you make about your health, well, 
it's the same thing. You need to be able to find the 20% of things that are going to yield 80% of the results. Because when it comes to your health, really, you just want to get to, you just want to have sort of 80, you want to get 80% of the, of, of the way there. Because honestly, almost everyone's happy if they can just get 80% of where they want to go. Now, when you get to 80%, you have to realize that there's another 80-20 to get to the next level. So let's just sort of open up the, and this is what's called a mind map. And a mind map is basically just a way, it's sort of like an easy way of doing slides and sort of allows you to categorize things. And uh, I put the importance of categorization here because unless you sort of have an idea of how to categorize different things when it comes to your health, you're really gonna have difficulty trying to determine what are those 20%. Now, this sort of law really is important for me to explain because it really should take a burden off your back. You should realize that you don't need to know it all. You really just have to determine the 20% that make the 80% of the result of the results. And of course, you know, this 80, 20 rule is not always 80, 20. It's not like it's exactly 20% of your clothes that you wear 80% of the time, you know, and the number doesn't have to even add up to a hundred. It could be 10% of your clothes that you wear 70% of the time. The point is, is to understand the fundamental principle here, which is that things are not equal. Inputs are not equal, and the inputs are not going to yield the same outputs. And the rule has been described as the law of the vital few. That is one of the ways it was defined, meaning that there are these few things that, that are truly vital. Um, now, when it comes to understanding this, what is the 80-20 of the 80-20? Once you get to the 80-20, you have to realize that there's another level to that. And the other level is that let's say, and let's take the example of, of your clothes, 20% of your clothes, let's say 20% of your clothes you wear 80% of the time. Then uh, let's, let's just break it on down to, let's say you have, um, you have 100 shirts and 20 of those shirts you wear 80% of the time. And if you look at those 20 shirts, it could be that six of them or five, let's just take even, let's take easy to use numbers. It could be that five of those 20, you wear 70% of the time. And the, the rest of those 15, you know, you don't wear as much, but they still make up, you know, in bulk that 20 make up 80%. So let's go through that again. It could be, that five of your shirts you wear 50% of the time. It could be. And the rest is dispersed. Now, the reason why this is important is because once you determine the 20% of foods that you need to eat or the 20% of types of exercise that you need to do, it could be that when you break that 20% down, you can make it even, we can refine it even more to, to realize that there could be a you know, 5% of those things that are making up 50 or 60% of the, of the input. And it's very important to, well, basically the way this, sorry, I see I have somebody is asking a question. Uh, let me just pull up that screen. Sorry, it's not immediately up. I'm sorry, let's see. If you have a question, um, I'm not able to actually see it. You have to put it into the chat box um, over here. I just type that into the, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm not seeing the question. So type it in over in the chat box. So how do we determine what the 20% is, what the vital few are? And the, the way you do that is, trying to get into the habit of categorizing things into in determining where they where they fall into the general scheme of of things that you're doing uh, this is very important there's actually a book here that i'm just going to read the beginning section of um, because it really describes exactly why it's very important not just from the perspective that we're talking about today uh, in terms of the 80-20 rule, but really why it's important to categorize things 
to advance your knowledge. Because the, the truth is, is that when it comes to medical education right now, what's happening is something called, uh, I forget, it was, they gave, someone gave it a good name. It, they called it, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, but basically um, medical edutainment or something, you know, where basically it's just, it's just entertainment. Um, and what makes there, there be an inexhaustible source of content for people who are just creating information for, ed, for edutainment, you know, is because they're just trying to, you can just list off fact after fact after fact, and you can do that forever. And your mind is just going to be filled with all these singular facts without putting them into the right categories. And then if you don't have the categories, there's really no wisdom that's developed. Wisdom happens when you're able to categorize things. And when you receive a new fact, you really are able to position it in the place that it's supposed to be. Now this book, um, I just wanted to read a little bit of it that talks about why it's important for you to learn to categorize things. And when you really start processing information and lectures like, like I'm giving you today, and you learn to automatically start to categorize it in your mind, like, well, this falls under this category. This falls, uh, uh, this falls under you know, the category of understanding you know, macronutrients. And this falls under the category of understanding vitamins, or this falls under the category of aerobic exercise, um, or, you know, you have to come up with these categories. So here's what it says. When one knows a number of things and understands how they are categorized and systematically interrelated, then he has a great advantage over one who has the same knowledge without such distinction. It's very much like the difference between looking at a well-arranged garden planted in rows and patterns and seeing a wild thicket or forest growing in confusion. When it, and what's happening is, especially with, the, with YouTube and such, people just, again, there's just this inexhaustible content and it's just easy to just throw out facts without putting them into categories. When an individual is confronted by many details and does not know how they relate to one another or their true place in a general system, then his intellect is given nothing more than a difficult, unsatisfying burden. How many of you really feel that way where you're trying to learn and do everything to improve your health, but you are really just, um, you know, getting feeling like there's a burden. There's just too much information. Well, as I've spoken about in uh, other lectures, my goal is for you to become your own authority in health, to be able to make decisions for yourself. And if I didn't think that goal, I've seen that goal be achievable for so many of my clients and patients. And it's only done because I, f I hope that you can see that my way of educating is to start from sort of general concepts and then narrow down so that you have a, a way of understanding things without just you know a, a series of un, you know series of facts that that may or may not be related to one another. So I'll read that again. When an individual is confronted by many details and does not know how they relate to one another or their true place in a general system, then his inquisitive intellect is given nothing more than a difficult, unsatisfying burden. He may struggle with it, but he will tire and grow weary long before he attains any gratification. Each detail will arouse his curiosity, but not having access to the concept as a whole, he will remain frustrated. That's basically what I hear from a lot of people who haven't worked with me. They're just overburdened and oftentimes so tired that they just want me to tell them what to do. And that is not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is creating people who, as I said, become their own authorities in health and are able to make decisions for themselves with the help, you know, that they're ex everyone needs experts, everyone needs teachers to, to rely on to guide them, but the decision made to, has to be made by yourself. I'll just continue. Uh, if one wishes to understand something, it is therefore very important that he be aware of other things associated with it, as well as its place among them. 
Without this, one's longing for truth will be frustrated and he will be pained by his unsatisfied desire. The exact opposite is true when one knows something in relation to its context. Since he sees it within its framework, he can go on and grasp other concepts associated with it and his success will bring him pleasure, pleasure and elation. That is really what is what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is not only is my goal for you to become your own authority in health, but it's also for you to derive pleasure from the ability to, to be able to place things in context because once you are, it's like pieces of a puzzle that come together. Um, and Dwight is saying, you know, uh, Dwight is saying information without context. Sorry about that. Information without context does not equal knowledge. Computer has information but lacks context. Therefore, it does not possess knowledge but merely is a repository of disconnected facts. So that's very true and that's exactly what we see today in, in education when it comes to um, medical information. When one studies a subject, he must therefore be aware of the place of each element within the most general scheme. When one takes into account existence as a whole, including everything imaginable, whether detectable um, by our senses or conceivable by, by our minds, then he recognizes that things are not all in the same category and level. The categories are both varied and numerous, and as they vary, so do the rules and principles associated with them. In order to comprehend the true nature of each thing, one must be able to recognize these dis dis distinctions. So that's really what we're talking about. So this concept, once you have internalized it and you start practicing it in the sense of using it to have an eye, using it on, in your daily day to day, then that's when you start to be able to really see some amazing things. Now let's get back to, uh, to the mind map here. So I think everyone understands the 80-20 rule now let's talk about it and, the, and you understand the importance of categorization. Uh, it's very, very important. Let's get into some examples. Let's close these down a little bit so that, okay. And I, there are so many things to go through. Uh, but let's start with what the four pillars of health are. So the four pillars of health, which many of you have um, know, because I've spoken about them before, are nutrition, mental state, environment, and movement, movement slash mechanics. Now, we're talking about the 80-20 rule, which basically means that for each individual person, one of these pillars is probably going to make up the majority of your health issues, health problems, or even optimal health. There is no question that I see people who have rock solid nutrition and they are obsessed with avoiding toxins and they exercise incredibly well. They are masters at, you know, but they're body hackers. They are, uh, they have all kinds of things to protect themselves from EMFs and from toxins and plastics and their nutrition is just rock solid. Well, but their mental state is not where it should be. They're enormously stressed. And it is in that situation where this one pillar can affect all the other pillars. They have everything in place, but they are sick, um, not just physically, but mentally. And, and it's because of one of the pillars. Same thing, I have patients who, they have a good meditation and spiritual practice, they practice gratitude, they do all the things that, that lead to a, a happy or satisfied mental state. They have their environment in order, they have their, their exercise in order, but their nutrition isn't. And for some people, if their nutrition isn't, it could be that that, uh, that upsets the car. The point is, is that one of these pillars is affecting you in an outsized fashion. And it could be that, you know, everything is in order um, except for one small thing in one of these things that just happens because of your natural in constitution is going to push you off the track. Now, if any of you are listening and you can tell me which 
one of these pillars is outsized. In other words, we're talking about four pillars, which would mean that 20, that if there was no such thing as the 80, 20 rule, that this would, whoops, that each one of these would account for 25% of your health. But now we're thinking in a different way. We're thinking about it in an 80, 20 fashion, which means that one of these is probably, it's the, it's probably the 25% that makes 80% of the effect. One of these is oversized. Um, so that's basically the, the situation. Sorry, I have to get this because it's, uh, it's, it's actually my father. And then one moment. Hi, I'm on a webinar. I'll call you afterwards. Okay, okay. Okay, bye. Parents always take precedence, sorry. So, um, if, so Sheila is mentioning that nutrition is, is definitely outsized for her, okay? Anyone else have, have some input as to which one of these is not 25% of your health, but you know maybe 70 or 80 or even 90% of your health? Does anyone think it's mental state? I'd love to hear that uh, because sometimes it takes a lot of investigation or environment. You know, a lot of people don't realize that there are toxins that are affecting them. Uh, for some, it's movement mechanics. Now, you're going to hear a lot of people, health gurus, who basically say that, you know, there's for everyone, nutrition is, you know, is 80% of, of your health. Uh, the truth is that that's not necessarily the case. Now, it's true. If your nutrition is off, you're, you know, that's really going to be an outsized proportion of, of your health going, going downhill. But assuming you get everything sort of average and you're doing all these reasonably well, one of these is going to, to be the one thing that's going to really move you to another level of health. And if, if anyone thinks they know what that is, then let me know. So let's go through it, and now we're going to take it from another category. We're going to take nutrition and look at it by itself. So 20% of the foods you eat are basically responsible for 80% of the ill effects. It could be 20% of the types of food that you're eating that are 80% of your weight gain. And that means that once you get that 20% out, you know, you're, you're, you're basically affecting your health and your weight in 80% 80, 80 of it. You're tackling 80% of the problem by, by approaching 20% of the types of food. Um, and Dwight's saying nutrition is extremely important, as we, uh, but for me, mental state is the master game. Yep, well, that's, there's no question that, uh, that that's very important for, for a lot of people. Um, so 20% of the types of food could be even less. Now we're talking about categories of food, right? We're talking about, well, we have of course macronutrients and micronutrients. And we can look at the macronutrients, carbs, protein, and fat. And then we can break down carbohydrates into simple carbohydrates um, like sugar and flour um, and white rice and white potato. These are very simple carbohydrates and they could make up 5% of your food. And really, honestly, that one small category in one small part of the, the span of food that you're eating in terms of types of food could be, affect, could be affecting 80% of, of the problem. Mental state, it's a very similar, similar thing. Uh, there was a great definition by Matt, um, Dr. Uh, Maltz, Maxwell Maltz, who was a plastic surgeon who also was a, a psychologist, I guess you could spoke a lot about psychology. And he basically said, happiness is a condition where the predominance of your thoughts are pleasant or something like that. But the truth is that when you look at the types of thoughts you have, that there are certain thoughts that are going to impact your overall mood and mental state a lot more than others. Now, I studied something called mental imagery by for many years with a teacher in New York by the name of Dr. Gerald Epstein and um, a blessed memory. And 
he taught me a technique called mental imagery, which was taught to him by his teacher. And it's a very simple sequence of very short, very, very short exercises, less than 10 minutes, and they can affect your mood and your performance, your motivation, your um, spiritual connection, feeling of, with just 10 minutes a day. And as you do these, it's even less than 10 minutes. It can be less than two minutes a day. And he used to call them micro inputs for macro output. He never really spoke about the 80-20 rule, but really that micro input for macro output, that is basically, that is basically the 80-20 rule. And there are techniques, tools that you can learn, not just in mental state with the example that I'm giving you, but in nutrition. And one of the ways is to discern what the nutritional density of your food is. I'm going to give us an actual another lecture on, on new, how to assess the nutritional density of your food. But that is another thing to think about when it comes to 80 in the 80 20 rule because that you have all these foods that you eat but when you look at them categorizing them based on nutrient density then you really are getting to the core of this rule now one doctor by the name of Joel Furman came up with a pro, a, a a rule where he basically said health equals nutrients over calories which means that you want to get the most nutrients per calorie so obviously Let's take flour as in white flour as an example. Well, the calories are a lot, but the nutrients, we're talking about a fraction here, the nutrients are very, very small. So that means the number is going to be very, very small. Let's take broccoli. Well, broccoli is low calorie and it's high nutrients. So the nutrient density is very, very high. So let's, we've been talking about categorizing things and then talking about how to really look at the category and then decide which of the 20% that make 80% of the effect. Well, if your diet is filled with nutrient uh, poor foods, then it could be that you just need to add a good, um, you know, you need to pick foods that are nutrient dense out of the span of all the foods, which could be, you know, a, a just a, a small category of foods. And as certainly, you know, cruciferous vegetables, uh, are certainly nutrient dense. You know, fruits are a little less nutrient dense, um, and you can start to think about it from that perspective. Um, when it comes to fat soluble vitamins, there are certain animal products that are more nutrient dense than others. Things like liver have a lot more, say, uh, fat soluble vitamins than than muscle meat per calorie. So there are lots of ways of looking at that. I'll be giving a full lecture. Uh, full webinar, I believe sometime in, in probably maybe April or March, we'll be doing these fairly regularly where we'll be talking just about nutrient density. So we'll leave that for that. Let's go to um, environment. Well, it could be a small number of toxins that could be affecting you in a negative way. Now, uh, in nutrigenomics or in genomics in general, there are people that possess a gene that that is very difficult for them to process certain types of toxins. And if you're in that particular situation, it could be that those toxins are affecting you in a much greater way, so much so that there are, and I'll be giving um, another webinar specifically on this, but there are certain toxins that increase your risk for diabetes in an enormous way. And, um, when you tackle that, in fact, um, you, you are getting to the heart of something that could that appears to be small in the context of understanding diabetes. Like you don't necessarily think of toxins, but it could be the twenty percent. It could be the small thing that's affecting you in a in a large way. In fact, some of the studies showed that when you take out toxins from the equation of type 2 diabetes, uh, the weight gain is, is really not a, not a reliable predictor of diabetes. But when you put in the toxins, it becomes more important. So there are lots of things 
the body is is a, a really remarkable thing and we're still getting to the core of these things but the more you learn the more you start to understand that it, it is the small things that sometimes we never even thought about that are making a huge impact uh, and again i'll be doing a full full lecture on that just checking on time here let's talk about movement mechanics and how that could play a role so we know now that and let's talk about it uh, in, a, in the sense of progression of what we've known over the years. So we've known for, the, for a little while now that like in the 80s and early 90s, people were doing a lot of aerobics. And aerobics was really what was considered to be, you know, you went to the gym, you ran on the treadmill for, for 40 minutes, or you did an aerobics class where you were jumping and dancing for 40 40 minutes, you were sweating, you were out of breath. Well, we realized that that is not an efficient way of exercising. In fact, it doesn't, it's really not a good way to exercise. And it turns out, just let's speaking about um, cardiovascular health, it turns out that long term high impact aerobics has is it's like a law of diminishing returns. You, you aren't getting the best that you can out of it. In fact, they've done things that are called Tabata sets where people sort of go all out on exercising for like four minutes. The original studies, I believe, by a prof the professor in Japan uh, was he basically was measuring your VO2, which is your ability of your red blood cells to take up oxygen. And that's a good way of assessing your fitness level especially your cardiovascular health, because you're able to exchange oxygen um, into your tissues efficiently. I remember when um, Lance Armstrong was tested, of course, we, turns out he was cheating in, in a way, but when he was doing that, his numbers were like crazy off the charts. Uh, of course, he, he had uh, help because he was um, doping, but the it basically showed that his VO2 was like through through the roof. Now, so VO2 is this, this measurement. And they, it turns out that just very, very high intensity interval training, which has now become fairly popular, where you don't need to elevate your heart rate for all that much time to be able to get a increase in VO2. And general recommendations now are that you don't ever want to be on a treadmill with your uh, with your uh, heart beating so fast that you can't carry on a conversation for more than 20 minutes. That would be the maximum. In fact, you can do high intensity interval training where you just do short bursts of sprints, you know, four, five, six in, in 20, 15 to 20 minutes, and you can still get the benefits that are incredibly remarkable. Same thing goes with weightlifting. Weightlifting, it turns out, and of course, it depends on the goal that you're looking for is you can, you can really design sort of a higher intensity short-term workout and get a lot better muscle uh, growth. So we're learning ways of improving the efficiency of these exercises. But when you understand it from the 80-20 rule, you realize that it's, it's, yes, it's improving efficiency, but it's also finding out where the small impacts in, inputs are yielding the greatest outputs. It's that 80-20 rule sort of showing up in, in this situation. So I hope that's, um, that's clear. Now we could go into detail. You could probably write you know, chapter after chapter after, after each one of these things. And I would love to spend more time on, on mental state because a lot of times we're not, you know, most of us are not aware of of the thoughts that are occurring in, into our mind. And we put a lot of effort into sort of um, overemphasizing, you know, it's like, it's like the 20% of the time that you spend overemphasizing certain thoughts. You know, we, we all have thoughts that spontaneously occur in our minds and they are sometimes, for many people, those spontaneous thoughts preoccupy themselves. And of all traditions throughout the world, those, if, if you're one of those people where these spontaneous thoughts are disrupting and 
disheartening, disconcerting, and they, they affect your overall mental state, just know that most traditions around the world, you know, suggest one, that they are more just a function of, of your mind and not, not really who you are. And two, you can learn to become more conscious of them and sort of let them go. And those particular thoughts, which don't make up the majority of your thoughts, but make up the majority of a lot of people's um, feeling of being upset about them, there are ways of, of getting rid of them. Anyway, that's sort of um, off topic. Okay, let's talk about uh, supplements. More is not better. And I, mu I must say, I had someone, um, I was seeing patients on Friday um, and Monday, or maybe it was on Monday, um, and I was talking to her and she said to me, I know you're really interested in um, nutrition and lifestyle. And she said, she asked me, what supplements should I be taking? And this was just after she had explained to me that probably, you know, the majority of the time she's eating junk. Well, this is a clear example of you know, supplements, understanding the place of supplements is, you know, she needs to get her, her nutrition in, in place. The, no supplement is going to affect you in that great a way. It's the 80-20 the, the there is clearly not going to be supplements that it's going to affect you in such a way. In fact, it's going to be the 80% that make up 20% of your results. And that's really what we're talking about for most people and most health, health advice. You, you read an article and it says do this and it says take this and it says avoid this. And you just add it to the list of the things that you're doing and you're not thinking about its category or its impact because it was recommended by somebody you respect. And for them, it may be the 20% that impacts them. An example is this create one example, one example of many that I could give, but this just sort of popped into my mind is a lot of anti-aging people are talking about um, NAD and how that is sort of, it's sort of the new anti-aging um, molecule. The truth is that, you know, and there are people that are taking supplements that are supposed to boost and they're going for um, IV, IVs and such. And while it may be that they are embar they have all the other things in place, just going in and doing that without thinking about the context of this in, in overall health just makes absolutely no sense. In addition to the fact that every couple years, um, there is a new supplement that, it, that comes on board that everyone starts to take without really, again, you have to, I think you're starting to understand, see why categorizing things is, good, is so important. When the new supplement comes out, everybody is saying you need to take it because they think it's like the 20%. It's the one thing that's gonna make a huge impact. But if you have any knowledge about science, it's never the case that that is, it's just, we're, we're like peeking, we're like opening the door and we're seeing a whole new thing and we think that the, the first thing that we see when we open that door is the whole thing. And it, it never, ever is. It's like resveratrol, you know, 20 years ago, um, everyone started to take, take it. And then we realized that, you know, it, it doesn't have the huge impact that, that we thought. So be very, very careful when, when that happens. I, I also want to warn you that when you see a lot of these supplements and things that come out, you have to understand that because I've met a lot of, I, I have the uh, um, opportunity to meet a lot of the people sort of behind the scenes at, at different shows and, and meetings. And a lot of these people who have a vested interest in making you think that this is the 20% that yields 80%, they have a vested interest in that because they often in, are co-owners of the supplements that may, that, that, um, that, that are made to boost, you know, X, whatever, whatever X is, it's, it's very, very, um, tricky. 
So supplements more is not better. You really need to know what, how to select them. And that's based on, on, on your goal. It could be anti-aging. It could be performance. It could be weight loss. Um, you really have to be able to understand the category. There's no question. I, I can't tell you how often people come in and um, I ask them what vitamins they're on. And I ask them, well, what, why are you taking that vitamin? And for most people, they just don't know. Maybe they saw a commercial on coenzyme Q10. Well, um, that's you know, unfortunately the case for a lot of people. Hopefully not for you because I'm hoping that you are uh, on this webinar because you're interested in, in uh, learning a little bit more. Now, all of you know that I'm a fan of the fasting mimicking diet. Classic, classic 80-20. Not exactly 80-20, but five days a month, yielding enormous impacts on your health. Um, same thing could be said about time-restricted feeding. You know, you're narrowing a small window, six hours, seven hours out of 24 hours, that are basically um, call, allowing you to to have this these these effects um, by condensing the the impact the time of eating. But fasting mimicking diet, five days a month. Amazing. You know, five, that's, that's the five days. That's uh, if we count, say, six days, uh, that would be uh, the, the sixth day being sort of your refeeding day. So let's say six days, that is 20% of, um, of the month. That's impacting you, I would say, 80 or 90% of improving blood markers like cholesterol and triglycerides and, and, and things that lead to impacts in your overall health. Uh, Nutrigenomics, uh, we spoke about, uh, was it last week um, or the week before, choosing nutrients based on genetics. Uh, it's classic 80-20. You're being able to choose and select based on some information. So you don't need to take 100 supplements. Um, you can, not or, or food, you can use information that that you can get by choosing very, very carefully. So that's what we're talking about. Um, there are many, many other examples of this when it comes to, uh, to your health. Is anyone out there, can anyone out there think of something, some small thing that impacts you in an enormous way? I'll tell you one that just came to mind for me. Sleep. Okay, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, how much of our life do we sleep? You know, well, it's, let's just say we, you know, it's one third of our day. Okay, so it's 33, let's say I sleep eight hours. It's 33%, you know, 33%. But if my sleep is off, it, it knocks me, at, I lose 80% of my productivity. So it's like 30, 33, 80. You know, I, I really, if my sleep is off, I am and completely inefficient. So can anyone think of something that either is sort of small that impacts you in a positive or negative way? So Paula is saying four, seven, eight breathing, um, which I believe is, uh, was doc is that Dr. Wiles breathing? Um, yeah, four, seven breathing rule, save, save my life. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've um, given that link to many, many people. To recommend and just doing that for a couple minutes a day um, can really it balances your your autonomic nervous system remarkably by doing that and that's just literally minutes per day that that is one of those things that's in a classic 80 20 um, it's probably it's less than that it's four minutes out of tw 24 hours that's like the one percent that yields 90 percent of of a, a balancing of your autonomic nervous system. Uh, anyone else have, thank you, Paula, for that. Any, anyone else have a, um, another example of something small that yields an enormous in, impact, either positive or negative? Type it into the box. Okay, let me just do a time check. Oh my gosh. I, you know, it's really remarkable how fast uh, these hours go. So what are the next steps? Well, first you have to determine what your goal is. Um, and Dwight is saying having a simple 
single, a single simple objective to achieve every day. And I think, I think that's great. Yeah. Because I think what you're implying there, Dwight, if I'm not putting words into your mouth, is that when you are able to have that objective, which is a simple input deciding for the day that that's what you're going to achieve, it basically creates an environment for the entire day of, of concentration, of, of uh, moving in the, you know, it's almost like the whole day becomes unified because you've been able to come up with this single simple objective for the day. I think that's, that's basically, that's exactly right. You spend a couple minutes in the morning um, saying what you, deciding what your intention is going to be for the day. And it's almost like the image that comes to mind is like it's sending out, you know, a like beam of, you know, just pushing forward through the day, sort of ordering things, you know, so that's great. Okay, so weight loss, let's say your weight loss is, so what are the categories of food? We sort of went over this that are the problem. Um, what are the, let's say it's simple carbohydrates. Well, how are you going? What are the 20% of things that are going to help you get rid of that? You know, a lot of times there are emotional reasons for why people eat processed carbohydrates because they're getting this blood sugar spike. Well, when we learn to understand that blood sugar spike, then there are things that are, are going to um, basically going to interfere with that. Uh, Anne is saying miracle noodles. <laughs> That's great. And I did not pay Anne to say that. Uh, it's true that having a small input of miracle noodles um, is going to be something that can affect, you know, the overall um, glycemic load of the food that you're eating. So, okay, you have, uh, and just to link it in with what we've just spoken about, let's say a processed carbohydrates um, are your problem. Okay, well, so you put that, you put miracle noodles in, just small thing to do, your blood sugar spike will not rise, um, which is going to help with the emotional issues involved, at least the feeling um, that happens with that. So <laughs> thank you, Anne, for, uh, for timing that so perfectly. Uh, thank you for that. Of course, a lot of people uh, come to me for coaching where we do the fasting mimicking diet, we do nutrigenomics, we also monitor blood tests. Um, and when you can monitor blood and keep in mind that one of the things that I teach that I haven't gotten into, there'll be a, a week where we'll be talking about what blood work you should be in control of because nowadays um, you can order your own blood work. Now I'm not saying that you need to become a master at that. I'm happy to order, you know, if, if you are in one of my groups, I you know I order blood work for, for people in my groups. It's very easy to do that these days. And they become the ones that are monitoring that themselves. Blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C, uh, body fat percentage, which you, you can do, the microbiome um, by sort of manipulating the different fibers and micronutrients in your all of these things can be looked at for optimal health. There's so many other things, sleep quality, you know, uh, micro mitochondrial health. All of these things often have things that you can use to measure. And once you're able to have a something to measure, then there are probably some very small inputs that are going to have a big impact. And you work with a coach or with a doctor or with someone to be able to determine what the small inputs are. So, um, so that is the 80, 20 rule. Um, and what can I say? I would love to hear some impact. This was sort of different than what I've spoken about in the past. If anyone had, you know, any sort of, um, insights into the something in their own health that is oversized it's an importance that you didn't realize before the lecture. I would love to hear it because I really do, as I mentioned in the very beginning, one of the reasons that, um, is, that I'm doing these is purely is selfish in a way. Uh, again, I'm, I'm writing a book and some of these lectures are sort of chapter subheadings and I'm using this 
to sort of outline the book in my mind, I'll probably transcribe these lectures and see if I can edit them down into something that it resembles a chapter um, and really need your input as to what you think of the topics that I'm discussing. I'm really happy that most of the people have stayed on the call, um, but I would love to hear if anyone has any insights that, that are oh, you know, inputs in their life that are oversized that they didn't realize that they have a better conception of um, now, that the, now that you've heard this lecture or any input about this lecture, negative or positive. I would love to hear that. Uh, I'll stay on for a couple minutes. And um, again, appreciative of everyone for being with me on a Thursday night at this time and spending an entire hour with me is really awesome. So I, I am very appreciative of you and spending time with me. Thank you again. Uh, again, I'll stay on for just a moment if anyone has any. Uh, so Marsha is saying, I was addicted to diet soda and I tried numerous times to quit. The little thing that worked was the fasting mimicking diet. The diet sodas now taste like chemicals. That is amazing. You literally just made my day. I had never, I, I do know that people's um, impacts from blood sugar are affected by the fasting mimicking diet. And I often see people who lose the desire for, for processed sugar after, after doing it because they realize that they feel the difference between a stable blood sugar and blood sugar that's out of control. But I have never heard that um, of that particular situation where you're, uh, and I'll just read it for everyone because it's amazing. Marcia said, I was addicted to diet soda. I've tried several times to quit. The little thing that worked was the fasting and mimicking diet. And if anyone doesn't know what that is, um, just send me an email at jonathan at miraclenoodle.com. Um, and all of you are more than happy to contact me. I'm so appreciative of you for um, being, being on, this, on, my, on this call. And Mar Marcia said she's been able to stop because they now taste like chemicals. That's amazing, um, which basically means that your palate has changed. Uh, and that's awesome. I mean, you literally made my day, Marsha. No question about it. That is, all, that is beyond amazing to me. Um, and she's saying she was shocked that she was able to quit. Well, keep it up. Uh, don't go back to diet sodas, uh, really. And... I, you know, I've spoken at length, uh, and there's no question it'll be in my book about the, how damaging to your palate the chemicals that are artificial, especially the artificial sweeteners, do. In other words, your 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 palate is like a thermostat, um, and your thermostat will be kicked off at a certain level of like sweetness. And when you are addicted to diet soda, your palate is um, is set too high. So that your ability to perceive natural sweetness is just devastated. So I'm just thinking out loud, it must mean for you that being off of them and go and fasting, probably a combination of being off of them for five days and the and just the the metabolic effects of fasting must have reset your palate. Uh, because honestly, if, if you took, say, someone in the middle of the, the rainforest and gave them a diet soda, they probably would taste, it probably would taste like chemicals to them. It wouldn't be a natural thing that, they're, that they were used to. So you've reset your palate. And I would imagine that you're actually, and um, I'm probably making an assumption here, I would love to hear your response, Marsha, but... Are you now appreciating natural sweetness like berries and you know fruit more than you were before? I would love to hear if that's the case. Like, are you able to? Is your are you um, detecting and appreciating natural foods better? Wow! And she'd been drinking diet soda for over thirty years. I'm so glad you told me about that, Marsha. If anyone wants to do the fasting mimicking diet. Um, 
um, contact me uh, because we have a whole uh, program where you get coaching from me, you get um, sometimes lab work, you get access to food tracking software, um, you get access to my private um, uh, HIPAA compliant doctor site. So you can store labs, you can um, contact me, etc. all that sort of stuff. Um, so she'd been drinking, so the diet soda taste is too sweet now. What about though, um, I don't know if you eat say berries. If you do, like, do you find the berries to be like really, because I've had people who, when I get them off for at least three to four weeks, and I get them off three, they're, they're, I just tell them, just stick with me for three weeks. Just give me two to three weeks. And, and the same thing happens with salt. I'll never forget. It was the funniest thing I had. I was seeing a patient and I, I was seeing him for a drug rash and he had just, um, he had just, he was reacting to one of his high blood pressure medications. Uh, I know, just getting back to Mar Marsha said, yes, I eat berries. Blackberries taste more intense now. Amazing. So your palate, if everyone could realize how their palate is perfectly suited to generate an enormous amount of pleasure from natural foods, if you could just get rid of all the crap, um, this is like testimony. The fact that her palate, Marsha's palate, was damaged by all the diet soda so that her ability to perceive natural sweetness was devastated by these chemicals. She got off of them with the fasting mimicking diet and now blue blackberries taste more intense. They taste the way uh, they should taste, which is these bundles of miraculous sweetness that are loaded with phytonutrients that are amazing for you. Like it's all there for us when, when, when we want it, if we can just get rid of this. So getting back to the patient, he came in with a drug rash. He'd just been discharged from the hospital. And um, he's one of those people where salt um, was an impact for his blood pressure. And he said, doc, I, I just can't get rid of, I just can't, nothing tastes good with, without salt. And I said to him, do me a favor. Please just give me two to three weeks. Just, you can go back to whatever you want afterwards, but bear with me for three weeks, two, three weeks, and, and just realize that your palate is gonna wake up because just like sweetness, saltness is also like a thermostat. If you're eating tons and tons of salt, well, it is just, just your palate gets set to be able to detect the sodium at a higher level, meaning you need more salt to detect that saltiness. But when you get off of salt, the thermostat resets. Well, he came back and he said to me, yep, you were absolutely right. He said, now things taste, um, taste fine. Um, and you know, when I, for a while I was, uh, it just so happens that um, nutrigenomics, where, which we spoke of last week, Donna, my past lectures are recorded um, send me an email or go to, they're not all on my YouTube channel, um, but send me an email and um, I will get you, I will get you uh, something. Marsha's also saying she likes olives now too and never liked them before. Amazing. You, you basically reset your palate. So uh, getting back to the salt, the salting, it's so awesome, Marsha. Um, so you're, you're probably just eating so much healthier in general. So hopefully you'll do the fasting mimicking diet again. Um, you should do it exactly the way it was suggested, which, is, um, which was based on the USC study. So every month, five days a month for three months, and then every three to four months thereafter. Uh, just before I sign off, because I mentioned the salt issue, when it comes to nutrigenomics, uh, where you can get... You oh awesome, Marsha. Um, and Marsha, are you not on our? Uh, you know, we have a um, with the fa with the fasting mimicking diet. We have a WhatsApp group, and we have um, the food tracking software, 
if you want to be part of all that, uh, send me an email. Um, and I'm typing in my, I mean, you don't have to, but you know, uh, you'll be able to ask me questions and such. Um, if you want to, if you want to do that, when it comes to nutrigenomics, you can get a, a test to look at your genes and some people are sensitive to salt. Some people are not sensitive to salt. There are some people that have a genetic, um, the genetic, um, you know, it's called a single nucleotide polymorphism where their blood pressure is responsive to salt. Um, and a lot of people um, don't have that where salt doesn't have an impact uh, on that. So any thoughts about Price's law regarding 80-20? The square root of N equals 50% of results. So 25 inputs, um, five produce half the benefits. It's, it's you know, the concept is... Um, the concept is is very similar. Yeah, I mean, you know, small inputs. I don't know that actual law, so thank you. For, I'll have to um, look at that. Uh, the square root of n equals fifty percent of the results. So twenty five inputs, five produce half the benefits. Yeah, I mean, you know, it as I mentioned with the Pareto principle, the eighty twenty. It's never exact. You know, it could be it could be that you know, that the square root is 50%, but it could be that, you know, five, the square root of the, the could be, you know, it could, it could be less than the square root. It, it could be that, you know, 25 inputs, three produce, you know, 50% of the results. Um, it's, it's all over the place. It's more about sort of the concept, but I thank you for pointing, for raising that. And I, um, that law, since I don't know it, and I, I, I'll love to uh, look at that after afterwards. Okay, I certainly hope this was recorded. Yes, it does look like it was recorded. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you so much, everyone, for your input. Thank you, Marsha, for sharing that with me. Um, that is awesome. You totally made my day with that. Uh, it's something that I hadn't um, heard of. I mean, again, people have their palates improved, but that's a dramatic improvement, and, and how great it is that you are able to, that you're able to get off diet soda. Um, the diet soda affects your microbiome depending on the sweetener, which, which means that your microbiome is probably a lot healthier, much, much healthier than it was before. Um, if, if you are still on, on the call and I saw, I see some other people who came on. Hi, Linda. Hi, Judy. Melkor. Um, uh, you probably came in a little bit later. I didn't see the actual list, uh, until now. I hope everything's good with you, Linda. Um, and my email address, if you can't see it, is Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at, um, oh, I'll put it here. I didn't, I think when I put it in before, it wasn't listed uh, to everyone else. Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N <coughs> at miraclenoodle.com. Definitely reach out to me. And <clears throat> like I said, we have a whole bunch of different things available. If you want more information, we've got the fasting mimicking diet. We have uh, nutrigenomics. Um, which both come with coaching and personal interaction. Uh, we have, uh, again, we're starting to do lab work on some people and lots of things going on. I'll also, also as Donna was, if you go to my, anyway, reach out to me and I'll, I'll get you, Heidi will um, get you some links to some of the other lectures. So thank you all. Um, Wish everyone a good evening and a good Friday and a good um, weekend. And thank you again for all your attention. <clears throat> and thank you, Dwight, for your comment as well. I appreciate you being on, on all my calls and I appreciate all of you. A lot of you, I would say, um, 
50% of you, or I would say the names look familiar from some of the other, from the other calls. So I, I enjoy doing this. I hope you can tell that. And I have a whole list of different things. And I plan on revisiting some of these topics, just like this one. Uh, I'm going to basically transcribe it and uh, try to get it into a format for a book chapter. And, um, and then I'll probably revisit it again uh, after it's been refined. Uh, this was sort of off the top of my head um, type of thing. And refine it and get it into more of a presentable, easy to understand form. That's why I do appreciate everyone's comments on, 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 on things. And, and um, yeah, okay, I, I'll keep on talking. So thank you again. I'm gonna stop the share button and I am going to um, say good night. Good night, everybody.